Hello. Uh, this is the first of our review sessions for uh, helping all of you or you know, answer any questions that you have related to the upcoming exam. So if you are one of my hybrid students, meaning you're my Tuesday classes, this is for the unit two exam and only the material from unit two is going to be tested. And if you are in my Wednesday class, it's your midterm exam. So that's material from both unit one and unit two. Um, so yeah, I'm basically here to answer whatever questions you have about the material from the chunk of stuff that you're gonna be tested on. I don't have anything prepared in terms of like, this isn't a lecture. Um, I'm not, I don't have a list of materials that I wanna go over. It's just, if you have questions, type them into the little chat bar and I will answer them in real time. Actually, I'm running just a little bit behind. Let me get my teaching materials together. Uh, so let me get, I've got my whiteboard and now I just need a marker. Where are my markers? Let's see. Marker, marker, whiteboard marker. Yeah. All right, I think we got some. That's okay, it's not great. Okay, good. That we got. All right, I think I am ready to go. So I see we've already got a couple people online. That's great. Um, whenever you're ready, whatever you want to talk about, I'm ready to go. Also, I just, I hope that everyone's doing all right. Um, I know there are already a couple people who uh, have family members who are, who are sick and who are in the hospital. Um, so I just, I, you know, I hope everyone is doing everything they can to stay safe and prevent this thing from moving further than it needs to. Uh, and, you know, I think about you all constantly. Um, and I just, I hope you're okay. And then, you know, my job is just to, to help on the academic side of things. So let me know how I can be helpful, right? Uh, tell you what, let me just add a little comment into here. Um, if something, you know, if anything happened, like I think my sound is coming out all right, but if my sound's not good, let me know and I'll, I don't know what I'll do, I'll do something. Um, okay, hi. Oops. Good if I can type. not like that many words. I will answer. There we go. All right. I feel this is, I mean, I feel like this is my first social interaction in a while with someone who's not living in my home. Uh, <laughs> this is kind of weird, but I guess this is the world that we're living in at least for the next little bit. So So yeah, I'm here. There's a study guide in the unit two course content folder. So no matter if you're in my hybrid or my uh, Wednesday class, if you go to the unit two folder down at the bottom of the page, there is a study guide. So you, uh, hybrid folks, it's just the unit two, like keywords and questions for each lecture. And obviously for my Wednesday class, 510, 
it's uh, unit one and unit two combined in there. There's a lot on that study guide, like no matter what class you're in, there's a lot of material um, that you're gonna be tested on this next week when you take this upcoming exam that's due next Sunday. I, I don't want you to get overwhelmed by it. Um, you might look at that study guide and think like in person and you've really been responsible on your own for all of this material. Just take it piece by piece, okay? Um, just start with one lecture and there are review videos for almost every lecture, uh, like almost every subject that's on the exam. There are review videos that are posted on Blackboard. So use those, they're meant to be helpful to you. If you've missed class or then, you know, all the stuff from unit two that we couldn't do together in person, go through those lecture videos because it explains everything that you need to know. Now, specifically thinking about the hominin evolution stuff, that like, you know, 7 million years of hominin evolution, which is covered in two videos. Um, the first one is called early hominin evolution from 7 million, or I think it's early hominin evolution, the first 5 million years. So that goes from 7 million years ago until about 2 million years ago. And it covers those major characteristics of hominin evolution, which are bipedalism, encephalization, tool use, and tooth morphology. Um, it also covers the groups Australopithecus and Paranthropus. I do not expect you to memorize every single species, okay? And I don't expect you to remember every single species and exactly when they lived and their exact brain size, right? Like you're not going to find a question on the exam that says, um, you know, that asks you to tell me that Australopithecus afarensis lived from 3.8 to 4.2 million years ago and I had a brain size of 420 cubic centimeters or whatever it is. I can't remember that myself. So I'm not going to ask you to do that. But I do want you to remember the, the general trends or the major characteristics of those groups. So like the Australopithecus group, uh, we know that they live in Africa, right? Even though the name Australopithecus might make you think of Australia, this is an African genus um, the, the name Australopithecus means Southern ape. Okay. Australo means South. And that's why Australia has the name Australia because it means the South land because it's a southernmost continent. So food was pretty low on average. Um, so they're eating less calorie dense, less nutrient dense food. So mostly plants, leaves, fruits, maybe grasses as well, because they're eating that less nutritious or less calorie dense food, they need bigger teeth because they're gonna to have to eat more of that food throughout the day to power their bodies. So they have to have big teeth to do all of that grinding and to withstand the stress of constant chewing. But also because they're taking in less calories, less proteins, less nutrient dense food, their brains aren't really able to expand as much. Um, we don't see that big encephalization until we get in each of these groups. Okay, um, I just saw a question. How many questions are there on the exam? How many short answer questions? I can't tell you that for certain right now because I haven't finished writing the exam. That's my job for after I finish the review session today. Um, I would expect, and again, there's gonna be differences between my hybrid classes and my Wednesday class. Um, I would predict that in terms of short answer questions, probably like three or four short answer questions. Um, I, I, yeah, probably not more than three or four short answer questions just because I have to grade them all individually. And, you know, if you take uh, three classes times, you know, however many students that is times however many short answer questions. That's a lot of stuff that I have to like physically grade. And I want to be able to get your results back to you quickly. So three or four short answer. And that means a couple sentences. Um, you know, I don't need it to be a huge, huge long paragraph, but it needs to be more than just one sentence or a couple words. Uh, for the unit two exam for my hybrid classes, that exam is worth 60 points. So I think you're looking at probably, you know, 20 some uh, short answer questions, somewhere around there. And then, I'm sorry, 20 multiple choice questions. And then for my uh, Wednesday class, maybe like 25 or a little bit more 
uh, multiple choice questions and then some short answer and some like fill in the blank and stuff like that. Yeah. Tell you what, after I, after I finish writing the exam, um, and when I post it, like I'll make a, I'll put an announcement or I'll put like a little notice above the exam in the unit two course content folder, something to let you know exactly how many of each type of question there is so that you know, before you go into it and take it. Okay. All right. All right, so yeah, I'm yammering a lot, which I said I wasn't gonna do unless I was responding to a question, but um, what questions do we have? And I'm just futzing with stuff that just out of your view. So if my hands look busy, they are, but my brain is focused on this. Okay. And also just, you know, it's okay if you don't have questions right now. This is only the first of many review sessions that we're gonna have over the next week. Tomorrow I'm gonna do another review like this through YouTube from six to 7 p.m. And then on Tuesday, I have my online office hours from one to 2 p.m. and then five to 6 p.m. Except those I'm doing over on Collaborate Ultra on Blackboard because I wanna keep those as like my regular office hours time. Um, so Tuesday on Collaborate Ultra, and then Wednesday also on Collaborate Ultra from 2 to 3 p.m. Thursday, I think I'm taking Thursday off, but if it if it turns out that we need to, we'll do a review on Thursday. And then Friday, 7 to 9 p.m., because who doesn't want to spend their Friday night uh, in quarantine doing anthropology review, right? That's just a, a good time for everyone. So if you don't have questions yet, but you're like, I'm just checking in to see what's going on, Make sure that I'm not missing anything. That's cool. I'm going to sit here for another 45 minutes. Uh, and, you know, something comes up. We'll talk about it. If not, we'll just enjoy each other's company. Okay, so I see another question about the exam. This says, what are some things we should pay close attention to when studying? I would say, think about the things that get sort of called back or referenced a lot as you're going through the lectures. So for example, um, if we're thinking about the, like the hominin evolution stuff, you know, the, the lectures start out with those four characteristics of the hominin lineage bipedalism, encephalization, the use of tools, and tooth morphology, which is the shape and the size of teeth. The reason why those four things are highlighted right at the beginning is because they all play a really important role in how the evolution of our lineage occurred over time and how we came to be the species that we are today. So think about how each of those factors plays into the groups that are discussed in the past. Right, so as I mentioned before, if you're thinking about the Australopithecus group, um, you know, ask the question, are they bipedal? Well, yes, they are because hominins are bipedal. So Australopithecus, um, you know, whether it's Afarensis or uh, Sediba or Deiromeda, whatever it is, the Australopithecines, yes, they were bipedal. They also though, probably still spent a good amount of time in the trees, especially at night. Um, so yeah, they're bipedal. 
uh, encephalization, do we see a big increase in brain size with the Australopithecus group? Uh, not so much, but it's going to continue to be important. That's why we talk about the size of their brains. Characteristics are represented in the three main groups of hominins that are focused on in that lecture. Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and then Homo. Um, I would also pay attention to things that are highlighted in the study guide. So for the um, hominin evolution lectures, if you're thinking about the genus Homo lecture, which is the second of the two hominin evolution uh, lectures. In that one, there are questions like, um, you know, what is, what does out of Africa one mean or what species was involved in out of Africa one? The reason why that question is there is because it's definitely something that I want you to know. If there are specific keywords that are highlighted after those review questions, make sure you know what those are and where they sort of fit into the whole narrative. So again, just think about the things that are sort of being repeated throughout the lectures or that are being highlighted specifically in review questions or on the study guide. Um, if we think back to like earlier in the semester, and this is for, um, for example, my Wednesday class who's being tested, they have their midterm exam coming up. And so they're being tested from the beginning of the semester until this point, things like um, enculturation, right? Enculturation shows up once as a word actually in the slide or like, you know, it's defined once in one of the slides, but we've talked about enculturation so many times and in so many contexts in the class and about how important it is for humans um, to learn culture by growing up in a society. So the concept of enculturation keeps coming back around and that's how you know that it's an important thing to understand for the exam. I hope that answers your question. That's still kind of a vague answer, but hopefully that does something for you. Things that you don't need to remember though, would be things like um, remembering how the Lytoli footprints were found, which we, I know we talked about in some of our classes, um, like in some of, you know, of my three classes, we talked about in some, the Lytoli footprints were found because two young grad students were out doing survey, right? They were walking around East Africa looking for fossils and looking for stone tools, looking for evidence of early hominin evolution. But after doing this survey work for days, probably weeks, it's hot, it was getting boring, they weren't finding all that much perhaps, they decided to have an elephant poop fight. And so they were picking up huge pieces of elephant poop and throwing it at each other, kind of like a game of dodgeball. And uh, one of them picked up this piece of elephant poop, threw it at the other guy. The other guy drops to the ground so he doesn't get hit right in the head with the elephant poop. And while he's laying on the ground and picking himself back up, he sees um, impressions on the ground surface of little raindrops. And then he realizes he's like little footprints, like little bird footprints. And he's looking at volcanic ash that has hardened into rock. And eventually he went and he got his boss uh, they came back and they started excavating and eventually they found the Lytoli footprints, which are the footprints of Australopithecus afarensis. Um, that's like the Lucy species. It's about 80 feet of like 80, you know, linear feet of these footprints walking across the African landscape. So that is a great story, but not something that you should be concerned about remembering for your exam.
have to sneeze. I'm not sick. <laughs> ah, excuse me. All right, tell you what, I need to run out for just a second. I'm going to keep this running. Okay, I'll be back in just a sec.
All right. Apologies. Thank you very much for your patience. Okay. Oh, good. I see another question has come in. Okay. So this question says, hi, professor. Can you please explain a little bit about the relationship between the brain and the teeth size in the Australopithecus species? Absolutely. This is a perfect, perfect question um, because it's exactly what you should be focusing on, right? So tell you what, what I'm going to do, if you remember, um, let's see, if you're in my Wednesday class, I actually gave you one of those uh, hominin evolution family trees. And if you were in my Tuesday classes, I don't think we got a chance to do it, but this is what it looks like. Okay. This family tree, this is linked as a PDF in the unit two course content folder. Um, it's either in the section with the early hominin evolution or it's in the genus homo, but this goes with both of those lectures. Okay. Now down in the yeah, bottom right hand corner, there's this thing. I know it's backwards for you. Um, there's this little table of hominin characteristics. So up top, we've got uh, teeth. This is the wrong marker. I don't know why I keep markers that are dried up and don't work, but I never seem to throw them away. Okay, so we've got teeth, brains, and diet, right? Those are the three things that I'm looking at. And now we have three groups that we're talking about. Paranthropus and Homo, okay? So let's start with Australopithecus. This is species like Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, or the Dakika baby, Salam, who was in homework number two. Those, that's also Australopithecus afarensis. All right, so Australopithecus is a, is a group of species um, that lived in East and South Africa between about two and four million years ago. Now, if we think about their teeth, what are the size of the teeth of Australopithecus? And especially if we, you know, compare to us. Compared to us, their teeth are big, right? But their brains compared to ours are small. And that sort of goes together because this also tells us something about their diet. If teeth are big, and this is one of the ways that we use um, the concept of uniformitarianism to better understand the past. If we look at animals who are alive today, we can look at how their teeth are adaptations to the foods that they eat. So if I were to ask you on the exam, what does, it, what does an animal's teeth tell us about its lifestyle or its behavior? We would say, well, first of all, teeth tell us about an animal's diet because our teeth are adapted to the types of foods that we eat on a regular basis. So cows have really big flat teeth and that's because they eat grass all day long. So they have to have teeth with these big flat surfaces that are resistant to the stress and the wear of that constant, constant grinding. Grass is low quality food, meaning that it doesn't have a lot of nutrition in it, right? Like if I told you, oh, you can have a hamburger or you can have a plate of grass, which one do you wanna eat to power you through your work day? Hopefully you would choose the hamburger, right? Or something protein, equivalent if you're vegan, um, because a pound of meat is going to take you further in terms of its calories and its nutrients than a pound of grass. If you're going to get that much energy out of grass, you have to eat a whole lot more. The more of a food that you have to eat to power your body, the more stress your mouth has to be able to withstand because you're gonna have to be grinding it up all day long, okay? So those things sort of fit together. So we've got their really big teeth, which tells us that they were they were spending a lot of their time grinding up probably low quality food. And their low quality food also makes sense in the context of their smaller brains, because the bigger your brain is, the better the food input that you need to power that big brain. So the, the way that I always think of this is, 
um, like during, during finals period, you know, like at the end of the semester, when you're writing all of your papers and you're studying for all of your exams, this happened to me all the time anyway, um, where I'd be like studying and working so hard. And then I would get to this point where I'm like, my brain is full. My brain won't work anymore. I can't fit any more information in. In fact, I think I'm getting stupider. Uh, and it, I felt like I had broken my brain from just all of the stuff that I was trying to put in it. But in reality, uh, what I should have been doing was taking a look at my diet because as I was in that stage of like, you know, working so hard and staying up all night, what I wasn't doing was putting nutritious food in my body, right? It was all eating like crap food, like Doritos and, uh, you know, chocolate or soda and coffee. And those foods don't power the body and they don't power the brain the way that healthier foods would. And so it wasn't that, you know, the brain was broken or it was too full of information. It's just that it needs good nutritious food in order to work properly. Okay. So, okay. So these three characteristics sort of go together. Now, if we think about the Paranthropus group, Paranthropus lived in East and South Africa from about um, one to three million years ago or one to two and a half million years ago. And in a lot of ways, they're similar to Australopithecus. In fact, for a long time, a lot of people called the Paranthropus species Australopithecus. And it's only been within you know, the last couple of decades that it's been split into two groups. The main difference between them is the, the Paranthropus species are a lot more robust, meaning they're a lot um, sort of sturdier, especially in the face. They have much bigger jaws, much thicker, uh, like thicker jaws, really big teeth. They've got these big flaring cheekbones. And you may remember from the lecture, these are the ones that have the little bony mohawk running across the top of their head. It's called the sagittal crest. That sagittal crest is a really cool adaptation because it allows for really big chewing muscles um, to develop and they insert on that crest. There's this sort of law of anatomy that the bigger the muscle you have, the bigger the point of attachment it needs. So you have a big muscle, it needs to anchor onto a big place of bone. In us, our chewing muscles, they start down here on our jaw, they run up under our cheekbone, and then they insert right around here. And so if you clench your jaw, you can feel your chewing muscles in your temple. But for Paranthropus, their chewing muscles were so big, they were so robust, that the cheekbone had to flare out just so that muscle could come up underneath. And then that extra bit of bone developed so that those muscles could insert on the top of their head. It's the same characteristic we see in gorillas. Gorillas are these giant primates, but they eat leaves, which is a really low quality food. So they need that big chewing apparatus to withstand the stresses of chewing leaves all day long. So with Paranthropus, their teeth, are they big or small? They are very big, the big. And their brain is also small. But then their diet, is it a high quality diet or a low quality diet? It is inferred to be a very low quality diet. So again, these characteristics kind of group together. And then finally, we come to the homo group. That includes us. And even if you haven't gone through the genus homo lecture yet, I bet you can tell where this whole thing is going, right? So in terms of our teeth, do we have teeth or small teeth, especially compared to our ancestors and relatives? We have pretty small teeth and we definitely have small faces. Our faces are getting smaller and smaller um, to that we have to have our wisdom teeth removed because there's literally not enough room left in our face as our faces have gotten smaller because the quality of our food has gone up, right? We don't have to work that hard to get enough calories to survive. And in fact, for a lot of us, our biggest concern isn't how do I get enough calories? It's how do I not get so much calories? Like take some calories away from me, right? We are facing very different problems than our ancestors ever faced in that regard. So the quality of our diet is high. And then our brains, especially compared to these guys, our brains are nice and big. Okay. So these sets of characteristics go together and they sort of help explain each other as well. So that was a very long explanation, but I hope um, by doing it in this way and thinking about how these, these sort of uh, characteristics sort, that that makes, makes all of it make a little bit more sense.
right? And we see this high quality diet or higher quality diet coming in with, with the homo species and a little bit with the Australopithecus species that were the ancestors. When we see these guys starting to incorporate more animal protein. Um, so in the earliest of days, if we're talking, you know, three million, three and a half million years ago, when we have some Australopithecus groups that look like they are uh, cutting up animal, we see cut marks on animal bones. We're not looking at a group of sophisticated hunters who are out there with bows and arrows or spears and chasing down their prey because they're like king of the jungle. We're still talking about relatively small little apey guys, but they happen to have these sharp stone tools that they've made. And so what they would do is most likely wait for an animal to die or um, act, they would find an animal that had been killed by another predator. So it's like, all right, we're going to stay, you know, 200 feet away from the lions. We'll let the lions kill that gazelle or kill that antelope. And then when the lions are done, that's when we go in and make our move. Or maybe if we wait for the lions and then the hyenas, we can probably chase off the vultures. Then we go in with our stone tools and we get whatever little scraps of meat are left. So that would be scraps around the ends of the bones or also accessing things like the brain. Most carnivores like lions or hyenas or tigers aren't going to be trying to crack into the skull of an animal that they've killed. But brains of animals contain a lot of nutrients, a lot of protein, and our ancestors figured that out. So they would go and they would bust open the skull or they would bust open the long bones to get to the marrow inside. So access to animal proteins was an important part of our evolutionary lineage. We start to see it with Australopithecus. And then as we get into the Homo species, it really kicks into higher gear. And that's when we see the big encephalization event, um, or that big trend towards encephalization with Homo ergaster. We have a big jump in brain size. You also start to see the controlled use of fire. So we have members of Homo erectus or Homo ergaster in Africa starting to use fire to even further prepare their food. Fire becomes like a pre-digestion, essentially. Um, when you cook food, it helps initiate the, the process of breaking down either the, the cellulose in plants or some of the proteins in meat, breaking it down just enough so that by the time it hits your digestive tract, you're able to absorb more of those nutrients. So it's like you can take better advantage of it. It's kind of like the difference between eating a raw potato and a, and a uh, baked potato. Like, which would you rather eat? Which is easier to eat? And which do you think your body is going to be able to make better use of? The baked potato, right? Because you're softening all of that plant material up. So when our ancestors not only started accessing animal proteins, but then being able to cook it as well, that's when we see this, uh, this really big increase in brain size because the nutrients going into the body are so increased. That's a great question. And I think the fact that I've rambled about that for a little while should hopefully communicate that it's, you know, that's an important, um, it's an important topic in, in that uh, discussion. Let me just check online to make sure. Sometimes questions show up on my phone before they show up there. Okay. Great. And you know, I'm scheduled to do this review from three until four. If there are questions, I can keep going for a little while after 4 p.m. Um, you know, I just didn't want to schedule this thing for like two hours and then just be sitting here in silence for two hours.
Oh, I see a question has come in. Okay, this says, uh, can you elaborate more on Out of Africa 1 and 2? Absolutely. And what a great question, because these are really important. These are really, really important. So let me do this again. Maybe sometime in the next day or two, I'll figure out a more sophisticated way uh, to show you stuff here, but okay. I'm going to attempt to draw part of the world and you're just gonna have to use your imagination uh, to sort of understand that this is how the world looks, okay? So there's my Africa. That. Okay. And then this comes up like that. Okay. Here's what I want you to imagine. Oops. Okay. This is the old world. This is Africa. Okay. There's Madagascar. This is Europe. We've got England and Ireland. And we've got Asia, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, right? Africa, Africa Asia, Europe, Australia. Not pictured here, North and South America, which would be on this side. Why am I not including them on my map? Because when it comes to human evolu evolution, they don't matter. We're only interested in the old world, okay? So now, out of Africa one, what is out of Africa one? If we can give one word to explain what this is, it's a migration, okay? This is a migration of hominins, as the name implies, out of the African continent. And again, if you have this family tree, which I would recommend downloading, if you haven't already, you'll see that there's a line right here that's leading from this species over to other parts of the world moving. So it's African species moving into Europe and Asia. And there's a little box here that says migration. This is the out of Africa one migration. Okay. Now the species that we see active in the out of Africa one migration, that is Homo ergaster or Homo erectus. So I'm just going to put H E right there. Um, but remember that on the exam, if I were to ask you about this, you'd want to use the whole name, Homo ergaster or Homo erectus. We can use either name. Out of Africa, one starts here. Okay, so we have Homo erectus, which evolves in Africa around 1.8 million years ago. Um, we see a really big increase in brain size with this species, we, have, we see an increased use of stone tools or more sophisticated stone tool technology. And this is the first species that starts to migrate outside of that initial African homeland. Now, they didn't start to, they didn't leave Africa like, oh, hey, now we're, you know, now we've got these big brains, let's, let's run to China or something. Or like, I've heard that France is wonderful. No. It's just that you have a group of hominins who are living here and because they're able to adapt to more types of environments because of their bigger brains, because of their more sophisticated technology, they start to move into new environmental zones. And it's they don't go from Africa to Europe overnight. It's little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, but all these little bits add up pretty quickly. So over the course of several thousand years, you have these Homo ergaster, moving from Africa, some of them swinging west into Europe, some of them swinging east into Asia, and some of them making it down into the islands of Indonesia, okay? In Africa, they start to spread. And maybe that's a better way to think of it. It's not a migration as in they all started in Africa and they all left Africa. No, it's just as they're spreading out, some of them end up migrating into Europe or into Asia and Indonesia. Okay. So now we have Homo ergaster, Homo erectus, by like 1 million years ago, living all over Europe, Asia, Indonesia. In each of these places, 
Homo ergaster, Homo erectus, we'll call it, continues to evolve. European Homo erectus continues to evolve. Asian Homo erectus continues to evolve. Indonesian Homo erectus continues to evolve. And they all evolve in their own sort of directions. Okay. So in Indonesia, Homo erectus, at least on a couple of these islands, they sort of get stuck on these islands and then they go through their own little evolutionary trajectory. So we have, for example, Homo floresiensis on one of these islands of Indonesia. That's that little dwarf species that Louise Leakey was talking about in the second homework or the first homework video for homework number two, right? Um, also, Homo luzonensis is another species from the Philippines that was just identified recently. It looks like maybe a similar thing happened where it was a Homo erectus that, because it got stuck on this island, it uh, some until pretty recently. In Europe, Homo erectus goes through a couple different, um, we see a couple different sort of steps along the way or, or branches of that family tree. You have species like Homo antecessor, Homo rudolfensis, and then you finally get Homo neanderthalensis in Europe. That's the Neanderthals right? Our European cousins. Then you also in Asia end up with this group called, uh, well, it's not a species. They're called the Denisovans. They don't have an actual species name because we don't have many specimens of them just yet, but we can tell based on the genes that have been left behind in their bones that they were a distinct species from the Neanderthals of Europe or us, which is an African species. Okay. So again, out of Africa, one is Homo ergaster, at 1.8 million years ago, starts in Africa, moves out into Europe, into Asia, and Indonesia. And in each of these places, continues to evolve into these new species. But there was still Homo ergaster left in Africa, which also continued to evolve until finally we have Homo sapiens, right, HS, Homo sapiens, the earliest fossils that we have are from up here in Morocco. They're about 315,000 years old. But this is the species that, uh, well, it's pretty cool because it's us, right? And so Homo sapiens is involved with out of Africa 2, which is basically the same thing as out of Africa 1. Um, but it happens somewhere between, let's say, 60 to 80,000 years ago. The date of that is constantly changing because people are finding older and older and evidence outside of Africa. But in Out of Africa 2, you have Homo sapiens, us, migrating out of the African continent, swinging west into Europe, swinging east into Asia, and then some of them coming all the way down into Australia for the first time. Okay. And so what happens when Homo sapiens migrate into Europe? Well, the Neanderthals are already living there and living in the Middle East. So what happens when these two species of hominins come into context or into contact? At least some of them got together and had babies, right? And we know that because we can find the DNA of Neanderthals in the DNA of humans alive today. So people with non-African ancestry have some Neanderthal DNA in them, typically. As humans swing east into Asia, they run into Denisovans. And what do they do? They have some babies too. And we know that because we can find Denisovan DNA in the DNA of humans today. And it looks like there was another group of hominins living in Africa at some point in the past that was different from us, it was still a hominin, so it was a, a relative, but it wasn't one of our, you know, direct ancestors. And maybe around 35,000 years ago, some humans in Africa mixed their genes with that other unknown hominin group. So everywhere we look in the world, everywhere that our species, humans, has spread out, we run into other species and we have babies with them. This is kind of a human characteristic. It's something that humans have done, um, you know, throughout the historical period as well. If you think about the last 500 years, as humans have been spreading out, you know, you have the Europeans spreading out um, in their conquest to, to dominate the planet and imperialism and colonialism. I'm not trying to say like, 
oh, that's just a natural part of being human is to try to dominate other people. Absolutely not. But even those people were like, basically they'd show up somewhere new. They would find, they would see people that look different from them. Um, that speak a different language, that eat different foods. And sometimes they were asking the question, like, who, who are you? Like, are you the same thing as me? Um, but one thing that they always did, they always had babies. Okay. This is just something that humans do. We move into new spaces and we have babies with whoever is there. And we can see the evidence for that um, in our own species today. Right. So I, I don't know. I love this. I love the idea that humans as they spread have, um, you know, brought in the genes of other um and that's the thing that um that you know unites all of us is how mixed up we all are so i hope that makes sense in terms of out of africa one and two there are migrations out of africa one is the first time second video for homework two he says that about 90 percent of our evolutionary history takes place in africa that's all the stuff what he's talking about in that 90 percent is the stuff that happened before out of Africa, to, out of Africa one rather. Okay. So most of our evolutionary history is right here. And then Homo ergaster is the first species to move outside of the African continent. Cool. All right. All right, um, it's closing in on four o'clock, but I'll stick around for a couple more minutes. Certainly, if you have another question that you've just been like waiting until I had stopped, you know, blah, blah, blahing about other stuff, um, don't hesitate, drop it in the comments here because then I can answer it. Or if you're like, no, I'm cool, then that's fine. We can wrap it up. Um, remember though, I will be back here again tomorrow, six to 7 p.m. And I just picked the times that I thought would probably be able to like, get people so it likes to threats you can tell that i haven't been lecturing regularly for the past two weeks because i can't i can't talk um <laughs> i tried to pick times throughout the week so that you know everyone would hopefully have the opportunity to drop in on at least one or two of these review sessions so tomorrow is 6 to 7 p.m tuesday and wednesday will be the regular office hour times on Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. And then Thursday, at the moment, I'm thinking on Sunday night, April 5th, all of the unit two stuff I would like turned in by Sunday night. Essentially, if I've given you something to do, it's due Sunday night. Um, that being said, I've already talked to a lot of you about whether it's technology issues or you have sick family members or whatever it is, um, you know, we have to build some flexibility into this system. So if you are feeling overwhelmed with classes, um, and I know my class is not the only one you're taking. So if you're overwhelmed with academic work or life or, you know, whatever is going on, if you need, a little bit more flexibility. You need me to work with you on something. You need to work with me on something. Get in touch with me. I'm a pretty reasonable person and we will figure it out, right? My goal as always is to help each of you be as successful as possible in this class. So the best way to make sure that happens, communicate with me when something's going on. Um, cause otherwise, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know how to best, um, sort of be helpful. Okay. All right, let me just make sure I'm not missing any questions. Okay. All right, are we missing anything or any anything you want to talk about? All right, well then I'm probably gonna end this now. Um, I'll leave this recording up on YouTube in case you wanna come back and look at it again. We've got a couple questions in, that's great. Um, also, if you 
if you know that you're not going to be able to sit in on one of these review sessions because of other obligations that you have, but you have a specific question that you want to have answered, you can also email me your question and then I'll be able, like, if I get a bunch of questions emailed, then I can also come into the reviews and I'm like, all right, we got like X, Y, and Z that we need to cover in this review video. It'll give me something to talk about. I'll give you something to listen to, and you can always come back to it later on. Okay. So yeah, that's it. Be well. Happy Sunday. Um, it's a gross weekend to be outside anyway. So I guess it's cool that we all have to stay inside. Uh, but yeah, I just, I, I hope everyone is doing all right. And the exam will be online tomorrow. I'll let you know how much stuff is on there. And yeah, I think that's it. I don't know. I'm not, my brain has turned off from lecturing. I'll be back. I'll be back in better form tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Take care, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.